Good morning, Waverly Roaders. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. Uh, we're here. It's a Friday, January 21st. It seems like January is flying by. We hope that everyone is okay during this cold January day. And uh, we're here to uh, share our weekly Bible lesson for the meeting room class and others who may tune in. Uh, we're going to open here in a minute with a prayer, and I want to conclude our prayer with what I call the serenity prayer. Mm -hmm. This little plaque uh, stays in the bedroom, and it tells me when I look at it what I can do, what I can't do, and what I ought to do. So we'll close with the serenity prayer. Uh, so before we get into our lesson this morning, let's open with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as a part of your Waverly Road community to study your word and to learn from your word what you would have us do as Christians here and now. First and foremost, we acknowledge you as our Father, not as Father of Waverly Roaders only or Father of Christians only, but as Father of the entire creation of the world. We know that you are the creator of everyone and everything. We especially thank you for making us in your image so that we can love others and love you and worship you and that we have a soul and eternal life. We know there are lots of folks in this world today that are hurting either physically or mentally or both. And we would lift them up to you and ask that you bring them comfort and solace in their individual situations. We pray for those in Waverly Road Church and our church as an institution, and we would lift it up to you and pray that you guide us in the right way as we seek to do your work in this world. Our serenity prayer that we will say this morning as we close this prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things, and wisdom to know the difference. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, our lesson today is entitled Justice, Judges, and Priest. It takes our lesson from last week and applies it to the role of leaders in the Jewish legal system. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 19, says that judges and officials must not distort justice or show partiality or take bribes. These leaders are to uphold righteously God's law and to fight for justice. The Torah, which specifies the law, is to be treated as a sacred document. The writer of our lesson says that down through the ages, there have been many Christian faith leaders who have up, upheld the law and fought for justice. She cites several of these leaders, and I got to confess, I, I didn't not know any much, of them. I have not heard much or anything <laughs> about any of them. So just to touch base on these that the writer mentions, Thomas Merton was an American Trappist monk who wrote profusely about right and wrong in our society. He was also an early protester of the Vietnam War as being an immoral and unjust war. Catherine of Siena was a Domitian nun in the 14th century who spoke against homelessness, Betsy, and hunger yes. of poor people, and she tried to influence the Catholic Church to act accordingly. Hildegard was a German nun in the 12th century who preached to the Pope and to the Emperor about having justice for all people. And Charles de Foucault was a 19th century cavalry officer in the French army of all things, and he left the army and became a priest and went to live among the poor in Algeria to help them seek justice. And then Benedict of Nursia lived in the sixth century in Italy 
and he was known as the founder of the Benedictine monks in that order, and he sought justice for peasants who were living in Italy at that time. So I thought those were interesting uh, mentions of people that our writer lifted up to us. And I, as I say, they were not real familiar to me. So now we're going to move on into our lesson. And Barbara is going to read us the scripture attached to our lesson today. So, Barbara. Okay. Good morning. This is from Deuteronomy 16 and 17. 16, 18 says, you shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes and all your towns that the Lord your God has given you, and they shall render just decisions for the people. You must not distort justice, you must not show partiality, and you must not accept bribes. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Justice and only justice you shall pursue so that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God has given you. Now from 17, 8. If a judicial decision is too difficult for you to make between one kind of bloodshed and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any such matters of dispute in your towns, then you shall immediately go up to the place that the Lord your God would choose, where you will consult with the Levitical priest and the judge who is in office in those days. They shall announce to you the decision in the case. Carry out exactly the decision that they announce to you from the place that the Lord will choose, diligently observing everything they instruct you. You must carry out fully the law they interpret for you or the ruling that they announce to you. Do not turn aside from the decision that they announce to you, either to the right or to the left. As for anyone who presumes to disobey the priest appointed to minister there to the Lord your God or the judge, that person shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. All the people hear and be afraid and will not act presumptuously again. Okay, thank you, Barbara. A powerful scripture. So now Betsy is going to talk to us about the legal system that is established in our lesson today. All yours, Betsy. One thing that I think is necessary for us to understand as we start this discussion is that the established society, which was the Hebrew established society and our society are governed by laws. Sometimes these laws are different, but the point is there are laws. Leaders in our judicial system have differing views. And that's why sometimes, uh, a decision is moved from one court to another. The differing views bring about people to follow each unique ruling. And so how we interpret and step forward to follow can vary. Impartiality and integrity uh, God had for the Hebrew people. Now remember, at the time this was written in Deuteronomy, there was no king. So there were no political leaders. If there were issues, the people were to go to the priests. So the relationship between church and state was a little unusual or at least different from what we see today. How should religion and state be related? That is an important question. Each person, whether they are following Christianity or any other religion, has to be able to decide how their life and their decisions are going to be rendered 
in keeping with the legal decisions that are handed down. We, uh, we need to remember that in the time of Deuteronomy, there was no court of appeals. What happens today when we have a situation that has been sent to court and we don't like the answer? We simply move it to a higher court. So remember, that was not the issue in Hebrew society. There was just one set of rules and it was the priests who were the ones to interpret and make decisions. We have society rules and religious rules in our lives today, which makes it rather difficult. The legal system and the religious beliefs and practices of people may not agree. Hebrews did not separate church and state. God was present in all parts of life. To keep faith with legal code was to keep faith with God, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> One of the things we want to consider is our form of government. We have three branches of government in our country. We have the legal system, we have the executive system, and we have the congressional group. Sometimes these do not agree and there are ways to move through the process so that we can come up with, hopefully, an impartial decision. Let me tell you a story that I heard this week that really bothers me. Um, we find that the legal system and the individuals who are part of the legal system uh, sometimes make decisions and then you turn around and look at their personal lives and you wonder, how are these to go together? This particular example I had that I heard about, as I said, was of concern to me. It has to do with our Supreme Court. As our Supreme Court has been meeting, one of our justices, Justice Sotomayor has diabetes badly. And therefore she is trying to keep away from COVID germs. Justice Gorsuch in the Supreme Court refuses to wear a mask. And therefore Justice Sotomayor is not making decisions inside the chamber. She is doing so in her office. Now, here are the people that are making the decisions for us in terms of the highest court in our land. But hey, the behavior that we're seeing here is questionable to me. I don't understand why everyone is not trying to help their neighbor. So what we're saying here is society is governed by laws, but how we interpret those laws and how we carry them out sometimes is of questionable interpretation. It needs to be that faith, in the legal code is a way of helping us understand that God has things he wants us to do. There are rules he wants us to follow. And with his help, we are able to do that. Okay, thank you, Betsy, for those comments. The section that I will comment on is entitled, Good, <clears throat> excuse me, is entitled Good Shepherds. We've learned from the Old Testament scripture, which Barbara read, 
it's very clear that the leaders of Judaism are to be models of ethical and godly behavior. What about Christian leaders? You know, the New Testament emphasizes the need for Christian leaders to have godly behavior. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul tells Timothy to train yourself in godliness. Now, what does it really mean to be godly, to train yourself in godliness? Well, one definition I looked up says godliness is to reflect the nature of the kingdom of God throughout the course of your everyday life. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Let me read it again. To reflect the nature of the kingdom of God throughout the course of your everyday life. The writer of our lesson suggests that a life of godliness means a life of spiritual development. What does that mean? She says it includes personal prayer, Bible study, self-examination, and attending worship services with others. Of course, the true example of Christian behavior is set by Jesus Christ. We all know that. He is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. And as Christians, we should seek to follow the good shepherd's guide for godliness. And what was that? To love God with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two rules for Christian godliness. So Barbara's going to give us stepping into the world. Barbara? Okay. The subject of the stepping into the world that our author used is a kind of church leadership. So we're going to talk just a little bit about that. Most, if not all, congregations will have its own leaders. However, the ultimate leader of every church is the Lord Jesus. He alone is the head of all the ministers and other leaders in, who are charged with preaching the gospel, administrating the life of the church, and carrying, carrying, I'm sorry, caring for the people of God. Presbyterianism uses the conciliar method of church government, which means leadership by group. The ministers and elders govern together as a group, and at all times, the office is for the service of the congregation to pray for them and to encourage them in the faith. In the PCUSA, of which Wavy Woke's a member, there's four categories of church government, the session, deacons, trustees, and elders. The session is made up of the elders and the pastor, who's the moderator, and also known as the ruling elder. Uh, with the, our church belongs to the host and presbytery, which belongs to the Senate of the Living Waters, and the General Assembly is where all the Senates and Presbytery churches come together. I believe they meet every two years on even number of years, so April is when they'll meet this year to make decisions as a group. And if I remember correctly, sometimes they'll make a decision and then it's passed back down to the church, different presbyteries to vote on whether they're going to follow it or not. So what is leadership, church leadership? The author used an example of a gentleman who was a judge and was also a good Christian. The prosecution had made the case that this person was so uh, should get the death penalty. And he had a hard time being a Christian, making the decision to kill someone, but the, he ultimately had to make that decision. And I think it bothered him um, for a long time, according to her. So leadership is the act of influencing or serving others out of Christ's interest in their lives. They accomplish God's, so that they will accomplish God's purpose. I looked on Mr. Google, who's my one of the people I go to when I have a question, <laughs> to get this um, leadership principles. Now, the first one, of course, is love. Love is central to Christianity and every Christian. Any Christian leader should be driven in his, her life by the love of God in anything that they do so that other people recognize the heart and motives of that leader. Modesty. 
uh, leader should not be a know-it-all or it's my way or hit the road. That's not a really good trait of a leader. Self-development. Jesus modeled self-development when he constantly slipped away to spend time with God or to seek God for insight into his will and his strength. Motivation. Instead of misleading or exploiting people, good leaders nurture others, such as Nehemiah motivated the people to rebuild the walls of Jericho. Correction. Christian leaders can approach correcting others in the right way by understanding their temperament, by respecting their concerns, by believing in their gifts, and by supporting their dreams, or by challenge, not challenging their files, talk to them reasonably. Integrity, practicing what he, she preaches, being consistent and dependable, doing what we say we would do, and living in such a way that others will trust us, and they should be followers of God will, God's will. A good leader seeks the Lord, commits his, her way to the Lord, and the Lord establishes the next step. Waverly Road is blessed to have had and currently has wonderful leaders who not only embody the leadership of God through Jesus Christ in ways that nourishes, strengthens, and helps us be guided by faith. Each of them bring integrity, compassion, and steadfastness when making decisions that affect us. We, right now, a big example is how they have handled the pandemic. And because of the decisions, we are able to continue to study God's work today, in the, even if we're in the comfort of our own home. Let us give thanks for each of them being a good role model for us and who embody the leadership of Jesus Christ in ways that nourish and strengthen us and help us be guide us in our faith. Okay. okay, thank you, Barbara. Well, we, that brings to a close our lesson for today, and uh, we trust that you have benefited from that. And Betsy is going to uh, dismiss us with a closing prayer. Holy Father God, we live in a society with many, many questions, probably as many as we have people. Please help us to know what it is that you want us to do, that when we go out, we go out with your blessing, trying to help those in need. Let us pay attention to our legal system to understand that the legal system is made up of judges whom you have chosen to help us understand what is right and what is wrong. Let us listen to their decisions and let us follow the way that you would have us go. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who walked among us and let us know how to behave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, see everybody next week. Okay, have a great week. Hope you do too. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.